that photo at the end of The Shining. Whatever happened there? I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. That photograph at the end of The Shining is a bit of a head-scratcher. It is almost like the ending of 2001, A Space Odyssey, where on the surface at least, it appears to make little logical sense leaving the closing of both films largely unexplained. When specifically asked about the 1920s photograph, Kubrick stated, Well, it was supposed to suggest a kind of um, evil reincarnation, Michael, where he is part of the hotel's history. A lot of people use this quote from Kubrick's phone call with Yaoi Junichi as evidence that the movie was simply a ghost story. Stanley made mention of an evil reincarnation cycle. Kubrick recalled the bathroom scene referenced in the beginning of this video, and then Kubrick continued. Uh, one is merely suggesting some kind of, um, you know, endless cycle of, uh, of, of the evil reincarnation, and um, also, well, that's it. Interesting, Kubrick cut himself off before elaborating, and then he revealed this key that is often omitted when discussing the quote in question. A sort of thing that I think is better left unexplained, but since you asked me, I'm trying to explain. I see, okay. From these cryptic phrases and other interviews where Kubrick discussed the subject matter of the novel specifically, many have insisted that Kubrick's movie was a ghost story and that the visions Danny, Wendy, and Jack see in the hotel must be real ghosts, rather than visualizations of their mental state, hallucinations, or some other non-supernatural explanation. Note, for our purposes here, we are excluding King's books and the so-called sequel movie Doctor Sleep. These have nothing to do with Kubrick's telling of the story. Regardless of the source material, there are simply no ghosts on screen in the real world of the film as we have said before and will say again. We believe the quote is being taken out of context, much like Kubrick's words from another interview that are often taken out of context in support of the belief that there are indeed ghosts in the film. The truth as we see it is that there are no ghosts in Kubrick's movie, and Kubrick never said that there were. Kubrick is explicitly referring to his thoughts on the novel, not the film as we have covered before. The full quote is far more ambiguous and does not directly address how to analyze his work. The quote was not a quote about Kubrick's cinematic masterpiece. The quote was in reference to Stephen King's novel. The quote about reincarnation is a little different, but the end result is much the same. Between the scene of Jack in the bathroom with Delbert Grady and Kubrick's mention about an evil reincarnation cycle, Many observers mistakenly form a connection when there is none to be found, somehow reasoning that reincarnation must mean the ghosts are real because both are supernatural, I guess. And therefore, this is a simple story about evil ghosts being reincarnated. But is it really that simple? To begin with, there is no connection between the existence of ghosts and belief in reincarnation. The one does not imply or say anything at all about the other. Jack appears in the photograph at the end as a real person at a real party. There is nothing to suggest that he is a ghost at that point, or that there are ghosts at that point. The only suggestion one can glean if you take the photograph at face value is that Jack visited the hotel in the 1920s and was somehow reborn after, only to return to the Overlook in his next life, perhaps being pulled there by fate or destiny or whatever. If you believe this is the case, and to be clear, we do not take it at face value, believing it's another example of Kubrick playing with the audience, it says absolutely nothing about the existence, presence, and nature of any ghosts that might or might not haunt the hotel, or the shining phenomenon in general. You cannot logically assert that because Jack was reincarnated, all ghosts we believe we see are real. Those who believe the ghosts are real still have to contend with other logical and sequential problems in the movie, all of which indicate Kubrick is intentionally manipulating the viewer. 
He is really using his filmmaking craft to depict madness, not the supernatural. The Delbert Grady that Jack believes he sees was supposed to be from some earlier era based on the clothing and overall setting. Jack appears to have made this up in his own mind because the other Grady mentioned in the film, during the opening sequence, was from a much more recent time period and had a different name. The man in the interview was Charles Grady, who was said to have gone mad and murdered his 8 and 10 year old daughters back in the 1970s, some 50 years later. We might even stretch so far as to believe that Charles is the reincarnation as Delbert somehow, but even that is not really a valid explanation because Jack has always been the caretaker. Charles would have been the caretaker in the 1970s. Is Charles supposed to be Jack? Further, Danny does not see an 8 and a 10 year old. He appears to see twin girls. In order to believe there are ghosts, one must believe that Jack sees the ghost of someone never mentioned in the film before, who happens to have the same last name, and Danny sees the ghosts of two other completely random people who just happen to be young girls. How many murders were there in the hotel over the years that Kubrick simply forgot to mention? Generally speaking, ghost stories unfold by learning who the ghost was in real life. Believing some aspect of their lives or death influences their behavior as a ghost. Essentially, it's a mystery after death. Kubrick, however, intentionally chooses to introduce a potential ghost in Charles Grady that is never mentioned again, then spins off at least five different possible ghosts that are completely unrelated and created entirely in the characters' heads. Lloyd, Delbert, the twin girls, and the woman in the bathtub. There are more if you count Wendy's visions toward the end, but the point is unchanged. None of these so-called ghosts is based on any character that we know is alive at some point or did anything at some point during the film. They are more obviously the fantasies of the characters in the film, picked up from bits and pieces that they've heard about the hotel and assembled from their own fears and insanities. The alternative is to believe that either Kubrick made a lot of mistakes or didn't know how to tell a ghost story in the first place. This is why knowing there are no real literal ghosts is the key to understanding and fully appreciating The Shining. That is what makes the film truly horrifying. It also proves key to understanding Kubrick's cryptic remark about reincarnation. Throughout the movie we are given various clues that Jack Torrance is an alcoholic and a loose cannon. We know that he had a drinking problem, and we know that he once injured his young son Danny when he was drunk. Danny started talking to his imaginary friend Tony around this time, and the doctor informed Wendy that episodes like the one Danny had are often brought on by emotional factors. We learn that Jack is an aspiring writer, and he believed some peace and quiet acting as the caretaker of the Overlook would afford him a chance to complete his writing project. All of the evidence going in, when taken together logically, strongly suggest an abusive alcoholic father who previously failed as a writer. This is the movie, right there. And what ultimately transpired was all spelled out directly in the opening interview. For some people, uh, solitude and isolation can of itself become a problem. And that is exactly what happened. You had an abusive recovering alcoholic with no access to booze, locked away without human contact, where Jack Torrance, the failed writer, re-emerged on full display. He had no outlet, no human contact. He resented his wife and his son believing they held him back, an obvious psychological defense mechanism for his own failures. He starts losing grasp of his own reality, with fantasies of having a drink, having a nice conversation where he could vent about his family, and he even fantasized about a beautiful, attractive woman representative of the wife he wished he had. Before long, his resentment of his family reached a point that he fantasized about murdering the two people who held him back, preventing him from realizing his full potential, his wife and child. It was the perfect storm scenario, all spelled out in the opening interview combined with everything we knew about Jack Torrance, an abusive recovering alcoholic who lacked the talent and skill to make it as a real writer. 
Wendy was in denial, defending Jack when explaining how Jack had mistakenly injured Danny after having too much to drink, and she insinuates Jack has roughly handled Danny that way many times previously. But while in isolation, Wendy herself became distanced from Jack, providing both with added isolation. Jack seemed irritable around Wendy, and she was looking for a human outlet on the radio once the phones had gone out. Note that Jack never saw a ghost prior to him again abusing his son Danny. This was foreshadowed two days before it happened, the creepy scene where Jack seemed on the verge of again hurting Danny. Danny asks his father if he would ever harm him or his mother. Jack becomes resentful and asks if his mother told him that. By the end of the discussion, Jack looks as if he's losing his temper as he tightly grabs Danny's left shoulder. This is the last time we actually see Danny with anyone before the incident. Wendy hears Jack yelling out in agony. He reveals that he had the worst nightmare. A terrible dream where he killed Wendy and Danny and chopped them up into little pieces. Wendy tries comforting Jack, and that is when Danny first re-emerges with his injury. It's his left shoulder and the left side of his neck that are injured. The exact area where Jack had his hands when we last saw them together, which was foreshadowed in the creepy scene two days prior. Wendy immediately blames Jack for hurting Danny, and Jack looks completely dumbfounded. He never denies it, however. Jack instead still looks as if he's woken up from a horrible dream, and he has, because he's just come to the realization that he once again abused and injured his son after losing his temper. Wendy was correct to blame Jack. Note that prior to this point in the movie, Jack never saw any so-called ghost. It was not until after that breaking point that he ventured into the gold room. In Jack's first encounter with Lloyd, he fantasizes that the drink he wants would be his first drink in five months. In that very same conversation, with regards to an instance where Wendy was mad after Jack had injured Danny, he says this. It was three goddamn years ago. A little fucker had thrown all my papers all over the floor. All I tried to do was pull them up. This also strongly implies that there was more than one incident of past abuse, establishing a pattern of abuse when taken with Wendy's earlier comment. This acts as further confirmation that Jack was the one who injured Danny, not some mysterious crazy ghost woman in room number 237. Jack's resentment toward Wendy is on full display throughout. Jack looks aggravated when Wendy tries offering him some loving encouragement after his initial writing struggles. Jack is angered when she intrudes his workspace and interrupts him. Jack was mighty perturbed at Wendy when Danny asked him if he'd ever harm either of them. And then there is this doozy. I could really write my own ticket if I went back to Boulder now, couldn't I? Shoveling out driveways, working a car wash. The language here reveals everything he always believed about Wendy. All of his resentful attitude explodes out here in this quick exchange revealing his true feelings about Wendy and how she ruined his life. I have let you fuck up my life so far, but I am not gonna let you fuck this up. Jack blames Wendy for him not having a better life, refusing to accept his own failure and passing on the blame. It strongly implies that not only was Jack abusive toward Danny, but that he may have likewise had a long history of abusing his wife, where past mistakes were blamed on his overindulgence of alcohol, but in reality it was an inherent part of his character brought on by his own shortcomings, where the alcohol was merely another coping mechanism for his many failures in life and his inability to live the life he believes he deserves. Kubrick provided us with the key to this early in the movie, with the sequence we like to refer to as the unreliable narrator. We see a model of the hedge maze, we see Jack looking down on it, and we're led to believe the next shot is a point of view shot of Jack looking down at the model. But in fact, this is actually an overhead view of the maze itself, with Danny and Wendy exploring it, after Wendy was previously warned that navigating the maze was quite the daunting task. Kubrick is telling the audience that you cannot always trust what you're seeing, and this is a key to understanding that there are no ghosts in Kubrick's movie. 
How does this relate to the two competing themes? Ghosts and or reincarnation versus abuse. The foundation of information that the entire reality of the film was based on all happened prior to the family arriving at the Overlook. Trust the information Kubrick is providing you here. The ghosts are the distraction. And we know this because Jack does not see a single ghost until after he abused Danny and injured his shoulder at the Overlook. The ghosts do not exist. No ghost in the movie, real or imagined, has any impact whatsoever on the story. The reality of the film is that Jack was a recovering alcoholic with a track record of failure and being abusive. Every single discussion Jack has with an imaginary ghost ties directly back into that, and the isolation and solitude itself becoming a problem was laid out right in the opening interview. In that sense, the traditional ghost story where we learn about the life of the ghost is inverted. The ghosts only serve to tell us more about Jack himself. So what is Kubrick really saying here? Uh, one is merely suggesting some kind of... Um you know, endless cycle of, uh, of, of the neutral reincarnation, and um, also, well, that's it. And then before deciding not to finish his thought, Kubrick concluded, A sort of thing that I think is better left unexplained, but it's since you asked me, I'm trying to explain. I see, okay. First, it is interesting that he stops himself, stating it is better left unexplained. Translation, he is not fully elaborated. He is letting us know there is far more to it than what he already said. And also note that he qualifies the statement with the word suggesting, which corresponds with the key to the mint, the unreliable narrative. Knowing that there are no ghosts in the movie, and knowing that it's really a movie about a history of abuse and failure from a recovering alcoholic who finds himself in total isolation with his own shortcomings flailing before him, the endless cycle of evil reincarnation, if taken literally, it could mean a ghost. But figuratively, it could just as easily be madness. Which, in the context of this movie, is directly tied into the cycle of abuse. Both substance abuse and child abuse, and also likely spousal abuse. If there is some kind of endless cycle of evil reincarnation, that is it. Kubrick masterfully depicts the cycle of violence, which is in a sense something that is reincarnated over and over again with the individual and often through the generations. The abuser never goes away, and the cycle is capable of repeating down the line forever and ever and ever. He or she might hide or suppress their abuse for a time, as Jack has done here. The first phase of the cycle appears before the movie begins. Repression of rage, however, can only last so long, and so the cycle repeats itself. The repetition is what Kubrick presents on screen, as the very same feelings of failure, resentment, and anger recur again, only more magnified this time in isolation with no booze. Jack has always been the caretaker because he has always been an abuser, and it will only be a matter of time before the cycle repeats itself. It is also often a generational thing, where the endless cycle of evil reincarnation perhaps indicates that Jack himself had an abusive father and a mother in denial. We believe that The Shining is the greatest horror film of all time, and once you realize there are no ghosts in the movie, it truly becomes a far more horrifying cinematic masterpiece. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful night. Well, that just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. I'm, uh, I'm outlining a new writing project, and uh, five months of peace is just what I want. Purely an accident. Uh, my husband had uh, been drinking, and he came home about three hours late. For some people, uh, solitude and isolation can, of itself, become a problem. Not for me. On this particular occasion, my husband just used too much strength, and he injured Danny's arm. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. Well, something will come. 
It's just a matter of settling back into the habit of riding every day. Yeah, that's all it is. <laughs> Whenever you come in here and interrupt me, you're breaking my concentration. You're distracting me. And it will then take me time to get back to where I was. Understand? Did your mother ever say that to you? That I would hurt you? No, oh, Dad. You sure? Yes, Dad. I killed you with Danny. <laughs> but I didn't just kill you. <laughs> I cut you up into little pieces. You son of a bitch! You did this to him! Did you? How could you? How could you? I didn't hurt him once, okay? An accident. Completely unintentional. What could happen to anybody? It's his mother. She uh, interferes. And it was three goddamn years ago. The little fucker had thrown all my papers all over the floor. All I tried to do was pull them up. There's a crazy woman in one of the rooms. She tried to strangle Danny. Are you out of your fucking mind? I could really write my own ticket if I went back to Boulder now, couldn't I? Shoveling out driveways, working a car wash. Have you ever thought for a single solitary moment about my responsibilities to my employers? Has it ever occurred to you that I have agreed to look after the Overlook Hotel until May the 1st? Wendy, I have let you fuck up my life so far, but I am not gonna let you fuck this up. Do it! Wendy! Do it! Give me the bag. Do it! Give me the bag. Ah, oh, God damn <laughs> Wendy, listen. Let me out of here and I'll forget the whole goddamn thing. It'll be just like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Just give me one more chance to prove it, Mr. Brady. That's all I ask. Yes, Dad. That's why I've always tried to avoid interviews and, and explanations about the film. So I think the film, you know, should be able to speak for itself.